Our first question. If you're non-binary, how can you be trans? <laughs> <laughs> I know where this one came from because... Um, I know where this one came from because I'm interested to hear your answer. But um, uh, one of my partners asked one of my partners asked this um, last night um, when I found out that we were going to be holding this today, and asked me that question: How can you be trans if you're not, how can you be trans if you're non-binary? And I said, because trans doesn't have to mean from point A to point B; it can be between or amongst. Mm. So that was my answer. Yeah, and I think it's, it is shifting sand, this, because when uh, Christina and I st first started writing our, our books on these topics, we were, like, dividing gender into cisgender, transgender, and further genders, which basically meant all the non-binary stuff. And now I would definitely put non-binary under the trans umbrella, because my understanding is of trans is that it means not remaining in the gender that you were assigned at birth. So by virtue of the fact most people are assigned male or female at birth, that would mean all non-binary people were trans. However... We need to be a bit more careful in that, because if you actually look at what, how non-binary people define, not all of them do see themselves as trans, first point. Second point, what about the trans cis binary? You know, is that, that's another binary. You may and what about intersex? Yeah. So I think it's, I think it's again, I mean, it goes back to what Charles was saying so rightly of like, when these labels crop up in therapy, what does it mean to you? You know, and maybe unpacking quite a lot those kind of labels, because yeah, some non-binary people are also going to feel that they fall outside of the trans cis binary as well as the male female binary. The next question is: If you're non-binary, how can you be bisexual? <laughs> I want to say that I came up with a bunch of questions on the bus here, and these are not those. <laughs> <laughs> these are significantly harder questions. <laughs> I'm going to be a bugger here. That was also from my partner. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that one goes back again to the way people define bisexuality that I spoke about earlier. So, yeah, if people are defining it as attraction to both men and women, then it, it, you could see that it conflicts to some extent with the idea of non-binary, um, of, of questioning the idea of the just being male and female. Um, however, because a lot of bisexual people define it as attraction to more than one gender deliberately in order to include more genders than just male or female. I think the two can and do often get... I think um, quite a lot of people who are questioning the binary of gender will then also question the binary of sexuality and vice versa, so there is some degree of overlap there. Do you want to add anything, DK? No, nope. good job. <laughs> <laughs> OK, DK. We'll go, to, we'll go to MJ's easier questions. <laughs> what is the overlap, if any, between trans and by experience and community? Oh, that's a huge question. How long have we got? <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, the first thing that occurs to me is the commonalities and obviously, contrarily, the differences. Um, yeah, I have the pleasure of having both oppressions. Um, so I can compare and contrast the two, um, amongst others. One I'm, I wanted to mention earlier specifically was in amongst the different phobias to include biphobia, but mm -hmm. also polyphobia. I face that, face that one too yeah. in society. It's enormous and has been since, you know, um, as long as I've been out. Um, so a lot of the stuff around <coughs> invisibility, a lot of the stuff around um, shame and guilt for not fitting into the binary, um, of either binary. <laughs> so there's a lot of commonalities there. Um, the differences, I think, in terms of bisexuality, I don't have to worry about which toilet I go to. As a trans person, I do. Mm -hmm. I can choose to be poked and prodded and laughed at by little old ladies and or, um, you know, beaten, raped or killed. It's not a great choice. Those are my choices about public toilets. Or to go to the disabled one, where I feel completely wrong because A, I'm not disabled, B, I'm preventing somebody who is from using that toilet. It's not a great choice. Go at home and hold it. Mm. Um, trans bladder. Yeah, trans bladder, absolutely. Mm. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great expression, I like that. 
Um, so, yeah, um, do you want to say anything about that, about commonalities? And yeah, I guess just to add about the overlap of communities, because as far as I'm aware, the studies that have looked at trans community have found high proportions of bisexuality, and the studies that look at bi community, like the ones I've done, have found quite a lot of trans people within bi community. So I guess there's something there about um, feeling safer in those shared spaces for, for, for both. I think perhaps when it comes to trans, if, I guess if you've got a partner who's bi, especially a partner who defines bi as attraction regardless of gender, then potentially gender transitions would be less of an issue uh, in those relationships. So, so trans people may, may to some extent be drawn to having a bi partner or being part of the bi community in that way. And also another commonality is both being excluded often from lesbian and gay space. Absolutely. So um, I think, you know, we did some stuff, um, Jane and I, with Diva magazine around lesbian women's views on bi women and having relationships with bi women. And there was still quite a lot of kind of worry about being cheated on and, you know, kind of people saying they wouldn't date someone bi. And then at the moment, there's quite a lot of kind of ideas around in some lesbian communities around, you know, trans men kind of taking away from butch women or like, you know, does that yeah. is, is that a problem for a kind of lesbian community? So I think, yeah, both bi and trans people having that kind of experience of exclusion may mean clubbing together <laughs> kind of makes sense and coming together in the same communities. Yeah, one thing I'd like to add on the relationship side of things is um, I've always identified as bi, stroke pan, stroke omni. Um, and my two partners of 17 years have both always identified as dykes. Good old-fashioned lesbian dykes. That's their chosen. Um, so initially being bi was problematical. However, when I transitioned, it became even more problematical. Because now the loving, affectionate term of wives that I've used for so many years, because we were ham-fasted, becomes for them a feeling of chattel. And it's no longer a word that I can use. Mm. Um, so it does have huge impact. Um, the fact that I'm bi was problematical because, of course, you know, they both had stated in earlier you know, relationships, I'd never been involved with a bi person because, you know, men as well, you. Um, and now I am one. So they've had to transition in their thinking as well. Mm. Mm -hmm. And also, I get, you know, the oppression within the oppression within the oppression because also as a transgender man who doesn't take testosterone, I don't get the luxury and the privilege of passing and therefore I'm even oppressed within the trans community mm -hmm. because obviously I'm not really trans, otherwise I'd take tea. How mm -hmm. many oppressions do you want? <laughs> <laughs> okay. One of the things, one of the things I noticed um, when I started working with trans people is that they demonstrate the plasticity of sexuality. That you might be working with somebody who is a dyke, who's never had relationships with men, transitions to being a trans man, um, continues to have sex with women, and then sometime down the road, and Aaron DeVore's research shows this, doesn't, doesn't it? Sometime down the road, wants to, well, starts to have relationships with guys. So they've gone from a, is it gold star lesbian? Is that the phrase that, that's used? <laughs> to, being, to being a gay man. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that that is anecdotally, I hear that quite a bit. I mean, again, it's one of those big umbrella, let's not make assumptions, because for some people, their, their sexuality stays exactly the same. Sure. For other people, it shifts and, and often in those kind of directions. Um, and also, again, I think unpacking gender is interesting to, to this. It's not just about, you know, the the perceived sex a person is that might change, but also that attraction to, to more femininity or more masculinity mm. or more androgyny um, might shift as well. I think it's, yeah, it's another good um, thing to alert us of how fluid uh, sexuality can be. Mm -hmm. um, and for some, it might be that gender just becomes less important or a lot more important because for some people it can feel really affirming to have a certain kind of gendered relationship that really affirms their sense. A lot of trans people and non-binary people, it can feel really affirming to have partners who see them as they feel themselves and also really the opposite when it's somebody who, who doesn't see them, how they see themselves. That can be an awful kind of disjunct kind of feeling. Absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah, classic add-on to that is from personal experience, and this is all very anecdotal, isn't it? Um, is that I find myself more attracted to men now as a man than I ever did as a perceived mm. woman. Because so it, yeah, it's it's it shifts the dynamic, doesn't it? It's yes, very different very to be a woman so. with a man than so. a man with a man or a non-binary person with a man. Yeah. Are those who are both bi and trans likely to experience even worse mental health 
due to the multiply being multiply marginalised. Yeah, it's kind of what I've been talking about, really. Um, how many marginalisations do you want to list? Um, I believe so, yes. I think these things are compounding. Um, it's a composite thing. It's not. There are individual things to take into consideration with each of these particular phobias and oppressions. However, you know, it, it's accumulative. The more, the more you're oppressed. Essentially, I've been pushed out of just about every walk of life. You know, I've been able to tick every box on the LGBT spectrum. And yet, I, none of them do I fit entirely. Mm. I think um, it looks like Alex over there has a point. Can we get a mic over to sure. her? That would be great. Mm. I, I was just going to say, yeah, it's not always additive. That's the only thing. Mm. It's like, mm. if you're, say if you're bi and trans and you're more in the bi communities, that might act as a little bit of a buffer because there might be a bit more accepting of trans. Or again, if you've got bi partners, mm. actually, it may be that bi plus trans equals slightly slightly less slightly yeah okay. so I think it's different for different people um, yeah I think the thing that matters to me about that is mm. I found um, community in queer mm. and that's where I fit yeah because all things we're going to say a lot about that I yeah think. I know I'm yeah. looking forward to the talks <laughs> about that later um, but yeah because <coughs> I can no longer so much be in the communities that I've used I used to be able to be in perfectly happily um, mm. queer is now mm. a community for me that I feel safe in mm. <laughs> Forgive me for asking the, the kind of dumb question. I'm hoping this is a safe space. That um, I'm wondering about how easy or difficult it is for people post-trans, so within the trans community, post-transition to assimilate within um, more traditional um, het relationships, and maybe that there's um, greater acceptance within the um, bisexual and queer community. So um, it's, a, it's a fuzzy question, but it's um, is there a, is it a sort of easier match to f to be to be kind of non-binary and bisexual than it is to be kind of interf interfacing with people who define their sexualities in more conventional ways, particularly around heterosexuality. Mm. I'm thinking of um, especially trans women who transition who are trying to have conventional het relationships, and, and many of the people I'm interfacing with are actually finding quite difficult. So, um, I was wondering if you could comment on that. Yeah, I mean, I think you're spot on about that again, and I'm not quite sure if much research has been done on it, but certainly it seems like that's people's experience. I mean, um, I think as a, as a trans woman, if you're going for a straight male partner, then, you know, there's a, the danger of, of being, you know, first of all, just of transphobia and being rejected, but also of kind of being exoticized and fetishized, which isn't, you know, great basis for relationship either so that's it's quite tricky territory and just I think within bi and queer communities there's just likely to be a lot more experience in that people will have and also just a lot more awareness um, not not in every community but I think generally they might be safer spaces for people to find relationships in and of course if you're non-binary you know what what is that to have a relationship with a straight person or a gay person like that that you know there is a danger that you're whole gender identity is going to be erased if somebody's seeing themselves as a Kinsey zero or a Kinsey six and what is it for them to be attracted to you it raises all kinds of questions about the kind of labels they use as well I guess did you want to say anything about that yeah it's quite problematic for me to even think about this stuff as you can imagine um, but I do have to deal with it in my client work so it's it's very relevant and needs talking about um, for me uh, bearing in mind that one of my partners is a transgender woman and is happily out so I can say that um, <coughs> there's so much to say it's almost difficult to know where to begin um, in fact I'm going to keep my thoughts for a minute in that and hopefully come back to it mm. if that's okay Alex mm. thank you shall I pitch another question in from, from your list can we say that bi and trans people have rather similar experiences being seen as not gay or straight or male or female and being discriminated against by both straight and gay worlds. What are the similarities and what are the differences? Yeah, I feel like DK already touched on a few of those, but um, the, the one about, I mean, I think it's the, it, to unpack what Charles was talking about, heteronormativity, the way, the way Judith Butler writes about that is like that it's the assumption that people are born ma just male or female, again, with the binary and the hierarchy with male privileged over female. But also, in, importantly, there's the idea that you stay that you know, and that you remain in a gender assigned at birth, and that it maps on perfectly to masculinity for male, femininity for female, and then finally that your attraction will be to the opposite. 
you know, supposed opposite. So I think in that sense, you know, bi and trans are both outside of heteronormativity, but in different ways. Bi is outside of that last bit, trans is outside of that kind of first bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but of course, it's important to remember that a lot of trans people see themselves as simply you know, male or female and don't, you know, don't experience themselves in any kind of non-binary way. Um, so maybe non-binary trans and bi have a bit even more overlap because it's about explicitly being outside the binaries. I wouldn't want people to go away with the idea that all trans people see themselves outside the male-female binary because actually most do not, I don't think. Mm. Yeah, I want to add something which is slightly off topic, but it really isn't. Um, there's a film that you all need to watch called Intersection, and it's actually spelled intersex with an X. I-O-N. It's a documentary on intersex, and it's an area that hasn't really been touched today, and I think it's really, really relevant today. Mm. Um, I may be a little bit biased. I saw it night before last. Um, <laughs> however, the fact, the sheer fact is, one in one and a half to two thousand people is <coughs> born intersex. That is a massive number. That means in your school, you do, every, everybody thinks, well, I don't know anybody who's intersex, or I don't know any parents of any intersex children. Actually, you have met them. You just don't know. And I think it's really bloody vital to bring them into this, this conversation. Mm-hmm. So I'm glad, you, I'm, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you flagged up the film because it, it features my friend Manny Bruce Mitchell from New Zealand. So, um, and I'm lucky enough to know about three intersex people. Um, I'm going to ask one last question and then I'm going to hand over to Leah and the floor. What does therapeutic good, or good therapeutic practice look like around bi and trans clients. Give us some tips as to what we might be aiming for. Wow. <laughs> I thought I'd leave you with an yeah, easy Yeah, thanks one. for that one. Whilst the others um, are thinking of their difficult Again, ones. how long is a piece of string? First of all, trust your client. Um, if they are unknowing and ununderstanding and, and wanting to explore, great. If they come to you with what they believe and know, and it's probably taken years, actually. <laughs> I'm speaking of my speak here earlier. I've, I've got, I'm going to say this again shortly. Mm. Um, Basically, trust your client because the greatest gift that you can give to them is is acceptance. And that means acceptance of how they view and feel and behave, Mm. not what labels you want to put on it. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I think a a, a good one for me, again, you know, bearing in mind the ground rules we had earlier, but I had a client who was a really interesting challenge for me who is by um, and came and and actually did want to talk about picking a side. And I was like, Oh crap! That's <laughs> yeah, that's quite challenging for me, um, you know. But actually, we did some really interesting work around, you know, that that person's experience of themselves having very specific kinds of attractions to men and to women, which which were really different for them when they were the attractions to men and attractions. We did some um, kind of em- empty chair stuff where those two sides um, talk to each other. And that really made sense for them. And it was really interesting to hear what was wrapped up in the attraction to masculinity and what was wrapped up in the attraction to femininity. They did a bit of unpacking of that. But, you know, for them it was really important to think around the kind of life, you know, again, going back to Charles' stuff, the kind of life um, she could have, you know, if she was in a fairly conventional relationship with a man or the kind of life she could have if she chose to engage much more with sort of lesbian and bi and queer kind of spaces. And that was a really live issue and, you know... Yeah, so, so I think you're right. You know, you can get into a kind of like, oh, well, affirmative looks like, you know, massively opening up gender and getting people to unpack it. Well, actually, for the trans person who's got a very simple experience of, like, I'm a guy and I need to just go through all of the transition, the, the evidence is strong that therapy that tries to get into unpacking it and, you know, analysing it all is really unhelpful. Mm-hmm. It's actually mm-hmm. damaging to somebody mm-hmm. in that situation. So we've got to be a bit careful about what, what does affirmative look like. It will be different for each client. Yeah, yeah. Um, in a reflective um, uh, anecdote again, I have a, a client I've worked with for quite some time who was um, brought up in a religious environment, <coughs> a seriously religious environment, and therefore had huge you know, guilt and shame around um, gay um, feelings and, and was desperate to, to come out of that. But on the other hand, my job wasn't to tell him religion is wrong. Mm. Um, because actually his faith was really important to him. So, you know, we agreed to disagree, but I had to support him fully in retaining his faith whilst unpacking that. Mm. Oh, yeah. mm. There's a really good YouTube clip as well called Intersexy. Have you seen Ooh. that? Mm. It's fabulous. Noted. Just Google Thank Intersexy. Thank you.